Welcome, everybody. I'm sorry for the slight delay. One of our guests um, got stuck in traffic, and she's still in transit. Um, but she will be arriving and then participating. Um, we've been in touch with her by phone, so she knows what's happening. Um, my name's Lynn Higinian. I'm a professor here in the English department and also a poet. Um, and the co-curator of the Holloway Poetry Series, um, along with Rosa Martinez, who is, um, and it's under the auspices of the Holloway Poetry Series that this event is taking place. It's a very special event um, because of the unusualness, indeed unprecedented character of the Indivisible Anthology, which I have put up here um, to advertise it. Um, I bought a copy when it first came out. It's a fantastic collection of really, really great poetry that not coincidentally is written by Americans of South Asian descent. Um, and I highly recommend that you purchase a copy of the book, which you can do after this evening's reading. Um, and thanks to the Cal Bookstore, copies are here and available for sale. Um, I'm going to turn the podium over to, is it Swati, are you taking over now? Um, to my friend, um, who is uh, also here in the English department, finishing her dissertation, um, and uh, is also a contributor to the book. So she has the somewhat embarrassing task of both introducing the book from the outside and then representing it from the inside. She will introduce the other, the poet editors of the anthology um, and the other poets who are reading in the event. So please welcome Swati Rana. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn and Rosa, for putting together the event and for supporting the anthology. Um, it's a great honor for me to welcome the two editors um, of Invisible this evening. Sumi Kaipa received her BA from UC Berkeley, an MFA in poetry from the Iowa Writers' Workshop, and she's the author of three chapbooks. Her work has been published in Chain, XCP, The Literary Review, and in the anthology Bay Poetics. She received the Holmes Award from 14 Hills Review and the Portrero Nuevo Fund Prize in 2002 for her first play. From 1998 to 2003, Sumi was also the founder and editor of Interlope, a magazine featuring experimental writing by Asian Americans, and was a literary curator for the Alliance of Emerging Creative Artists and New Langton Arts. On top of this, she recently earned her doctorate in psychology and is completing her first full-length collection of poetry. Purini Sundar Lingam's work is situated at the confluence of science and art. Educated at Oxford, she has held scientific research posts at MIT, UCLA, and Oxford, as well as fellowships in cognitive science and poetry. She was artist in residence at the De Young Fine Arts Museum this year, and her poems have been published in Plowshares, The Progressive, Ciphers, and Caravan, as well as translated into French, Gaelic, Swedish, and Tamil. Perini has just guest edited a special issue of World Literature Today on science and literature, and has spoken on the intersections between poetry and the brain at MoMA, the Exploratorium, and the De Young Fine Arts Museum. The third editor of the, of the anthology, Nilanjana Banerjee, she can't join us today because she's in India completing a collection of short stories. Um, Indivisible is really a tribute to the vision and dedication of these three fabulous editors and writers that I've come to know over the past year in giving readings um, around the Bay Area. They've brought together an ensemble of South Asian poets, as Lynn mentioned, from Bangladesh, India, Nepal, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka, who are all engaged in crafting the many meanings of what it means to be South Asian in America. His historian Vijay Prashad writes of the anthology, no one can speak for America or humanity, but these poems give us a glimpse of both. Scattered among them are treasures and heartbreaks, mercurial descriptions of life and languid backward glances at what is left behind, what cannot be recovered. This is a language map of South Asian America. As the title of the anthology suggests, this map is both unified and fragmentary. We cannot hear the word indivisible without hearing the sound of divisibility within it. For each poet, uh, and I think this is really remarkable about the anthology, is that we get not only the poems but all, and the biography of the poets, but also a quotation from the poets um, giving their own self-identification. 
Whether these poets call themselves queer diasporan, sixth generation Trinidadian, radical Desi internationalist, or Pakistani Punjabi Muslim Mid Mid Midwestern American, I knew I'd stumble over that one. Um, they transform South Asianness into a problem not of categorization, but of imagination. The editors have just finished a 13 city book tour of the East Coast and the Midwest, and we're so glad they found their way back to the Bay Area. Please join me in welcoming Sumi and later Purimi. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thanks to Lynn and to Rosa and to Swathi um, for those wonderful introductions and for having us here at the Holloway Poet Series. And thank you all for being here in the audience. Um, my co-editor, um, ironically, was at the airport earlier today picking up her brother who's coming from abroad and who was detained for about an hour um, questioning and things like that because of possibly looking like a terrorist. And so I think that there's something um, I think that that's a, that's a good um, maybe foundation for one of the reasons why we started this anthology is we were really thinking about post 9-11 America and um, what the role of South Asians was in post 9-11 America, especially um, as writers and as poets. And um, we were originally approached by a woman named Kim McMillan, a literary uh, publicist um, who was working with a small press in Berkeley at the time, um, who wanted us to curate something that was like a response to 9-11 from the South Asian community. But as we delved into the problem of South Asian American poetry, we realized that it was um, that we were interested in that problem, the post 9-11, but that we were interested in so many other things about South Asian American and about South Asian American writing. So it grew to much larger proportions. And so here we are today celebrating Indivisible. Um, and I think as Swathi said, um, the poets that are in this anthology um, identify with being from many different parts of South Asia, uh, Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka, um, Nepal, I think, did I get them all? <laughs> um, and they, you know, and, and we were really careful again in choosing the title of the anthology because we were really thinking about what South Asia is. South Asia, to some extent, is a construction now. Um, it, they're, they're countries that share heritage in common, but it's also really complicated by the fact that there are many different religions that people identify with, many different languages, and many different regions. So it's b being such a complicated um, place and um, having so many different people who have different kinds of uh, ethnic identities, we were really interested in this idea that South Asia is complicated by all of these different um, fragments and that also coming into the United States um, being a part of the American dream and being part of the American, the fabric of America is also um, is also an endeavor in being part of a multicultural society. So, indivisible is a little bit like a question: Can we be both from many different um, ethnic backgrounds and from many different vantage points and still come together in some kind of unity, in some kind of um, collective thinking, productive collective thinking. So, so uh, that gives you kind of an idea of where the anthology came from. And when my co-editor is here later on, she will tell you a little bit more um, about the process of the anthology as we move along in this event. So thanks. And let me go ahead and introduce the first author. Tanuja Mehrotra was born in Cleveland, Ohio, and she spent a couple of years in West Virginia before moving to Jacksonville, Florida, where she spent most of her childhood. She holds a BA from Wellesley College, an MA in English from Tulane University, and an MFA in creative writing from San Francisco State University. Tanu has been awarded the Academy of American Poets Prize and the Amanda Sterner Butler Prize for Poetry. Her poems have appeared in the Asian Pacific American Journal, Transfer, Dogwood, and the Fourteen Hills Review. Currently, she is working on her first collection of poetry, a book based on her invented form of threaded guzzles. She lives with her husband and her two daughters in Belmont, California. So please help me welcome Tanu Mehrotra. Thank you. <clears throat> um, 
think the first poem I'm going to read tonight is one that's in the collection, and um, it's, it is this form I invented called the threaded guzzle. I was trying to write guzzles in English. It's a form that's usually written in Persian or in Urdu, and um, I was finding that the, the form itself was constraining me, but there were parts of the form that I was really enjoying exploring. So I started breaking up the couplets, because guzzles are comprised of these, these rhyming couplets. I sort of broke them up amongst other forms, and it really created this new form for me that's been really exciting. It sort of draws on autobiography and song and um, narrative. So I'm going to read one of those that's in the anthology. It's called Song for New Orleans. Sitting still in New Orleans, the wet, hot fill of New Orleans. From an attic apartment, I watch the neighbor's gutted roof. It gapes at the sky. Watch pigeon after pigeon fly through that roof, the house of pigeon midwifery. Armand, he's tired, so tired, but he can't sleep. A live oak cracks open the sidewalk, roots fit to burst through concrete. Dancing to a fiddle dee dee, funkadelic song. The Mardi Gras Indian stretches his feathered wings. He preens for our eyes to feast. A district, a parish, a ward, a tourist, a tossed sugar pie, the trill in New Orleans. Armand, he's tired, so, so tired, but he will not sleep. He watches through the window, blue bird on a willow. Daylight fades to yellow, but his eyes yearn green. Birds on the windowsill taunt him. His soft paw bats the window trim. These days, he says, these days are grim, with many more to see. Beads, 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 purple, gold, green. Rearending the meter maid on Milan, say it Milan Street, or was it Chapatulis? The window grows colder, that bluebird sings bolder, Armand's bones grown older, how he longs to fly free. Gravestones sweat above ground, stone angels embrace their kill in New Orleans. Wading into a street of water up to my thighs, trying to get the car out alive. The ferrets, Beezus and Ramona, they loved to be bathed, wilting on the edges of a quarter. Feline dream life, I can tell, is deeper than a wishing well, richer than this mortal hell hanging from a tree. He chews slowly, surely he chews at the hot dog bits laid bare on a window sill in New Orleans. But you have fleas, people had fleas, he shouts at the girl, grossed out by Dunn's conceit. Professor Ray extends a hanky, a guitar, a song once sung by Fred Astaire. It's never what we say, is it? It's how we say it, to whom we say it to earn a living at brightness. Armand, I'll give you birds at sea. You do not need to comfort me. Window is open, can't you see? Feathers in the breeze. An orange offered moments before she dies. A glowing orb of birds sing shrill in New Orleans. The black woman in a pink antebellum gown gives us a tour of the plantation gestures toward the servant quarters, glass bulbs with honey to catch the flies. That conference was the first time I went someplace without daddy. I was eating in a hotel and I saw they had Irish coffee. I thought of back home with condensed milk and lots and lots of sugar, but this, it had a different taste. I could barely open my eyes the next morning, but I've changed. I like that Asti Spumanti and the margarita what? Wine coolers, those are really nice. Annotated bibliographies, how proudly Professor Terry complained his ear was tin. To eat beignets, to garden, to meditate, to do anything other than hunt for traces of empire in Keats's To Autumn. 
a quarter an antique, the wrought iron of a fence, the levee drinks a hollowing hill in New Orleans. Armand, he's tired, so, so tired. When will he sleep? Dad and I stand for an hour inside that sound, preservation of jazz, tang of piano, and slow trombone, whirring fans. We watch the instruments talk to each other in the heat, wooden floorboards catching all that falls away. Step into the night, and Daddy says, my God, my, my, let's eat this ice cream. So, I was going to read another threaded guzzle I've done that's a lot shorter. And um, this one is called Torch Song. I lose my place in the sound, a splendid fleeting trace in the sound. A waterlogged Norton anthology. You are the onion skin pages on me. Why are you so far away, she said, and won't you ever know that I'm in love with you, that I'm in love with you. Our mothers, child psychiatrists of sound, yours ground her cigarette in a coffee plant. Mine said, wear more hats, go on dates just to sit behind you in eighth period, just to watch your hands on the page. Cut up the voices and sliver for a slower pace in the sound. A real ache, I swear, ache. Scoop me up like the book, oh please. My father fasted only six times in his life, five times for each of his daughter's weddings, the sixth time when Gandhiji died. That the beloved, dark and brooding, that the love, unspoken, not of the body, but of the book, left open. Hands like your hands, such unsettling grace in the sound. To be invisible, turn to page 365, to be seen, before the taste of tongue became as common as spitting couplets into metal boxes. Imagine the time before. Scarred hand from wrist to knuckle, hand through wall, waist in the sound. Please, 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 let me, let me, let me, let me get what I want this time. That he loved Cindy, then Shannon, then Jenny, then. My mother married my father when he was 11 and she was nine, but she did not go and live with him until she was 12 or so. Mash, pash, reverence, yen, what wallflowers do, sit longing, sit still, sit. Your affection, those elusive threads chased in the sound. The ping pong pang of it, not the kind to think, just thought, your hands. Try as she may to stay with you, Thanu sees another face in the sound. My mother collapsed into my father's arms. She actually died like that. Thank you. And I'll read one more short poem. This is called Song for the Zamboni, the machine that cleans the ice. <laughs> Behold, beware, beloved, the big blue machine named after its inventor, Zamboni, first name, Frank. Your humming glides across the ice rink, bewitches us as you erase our etchings, our scrapes, a frozen surface revived. Once we slid, flailed, and fell hard, repeatedly, until the ice god took our hands, stretched them in front of us, and said, cup your palms as if you were holding water and didn't want to spill a drop. But now you, Zamboni, have our hearts as you glide over the ice better than we ever could, dissolving all our scores. We wait and watch your work and want again to rush onto the ticky-tack rink with tin foil for a ceiling. You offer no exegesis for our desire, but you know, don't you, how much you are admired. And so you renew the worn out ice with a watery glaze, with a blade. Thank you. So my
my co-editor has appeared. <laughs> <laughs> so here's Preeny. Um, sorry for the uh, delay. Um, I'll explain a little bit more about that later. But um, I wonder if you've talked about the indivisible and the 9-11. Ha I have. <laughs> OK, OK. It was a segue as to why life has become more complicated for those of us um, who uh, come from South Asia. I was trying to pick up my brother from the airport who was held by security this afternoon. He's deaf and doesn't speak, and so they decided to interrogate him as a terrorist. So I have, uh, I'm sorry I was late. I was trying to get him out of SFO and get him home. So, <laughs> um, so why didn't you? Um, I think that, okay. <laughs> um, well, I think I, I mentioned earlier that there were many different reasons why we came together to put this anthology together, um, especially after we realized that it was going to be a much larger project than just thinking about South Asians after 9-11. And one of the things that we were really interested in mining was that um, South Asians have had a pretty a substantial presence in fiction thus far. Um, there are a lot of different people who have won awards. Um, so Jhumpa Lahiri has become kind of a household name. Everyone, you know, the namesake was made into like a blockbuster movie. Um, and so I, given that, we were really aware of how much South Asian poets had not been given any voice. And we were really also very, we, we found it very important, actually, to give the poets voice because the poets are not necessarily drawn to um, the commercial enterprise of weaving the story that's palatable to um, the American public who, who can kind of stomach, you know, a, a little bit more of a, the stereotype of what the South Asian American experience is. And so one of the reasons, one of the ways that we thought of this, this book was to put together as many voices as possible to try to illustrate the various experiences. And so we have 49 poets. And together, I think, it gives you a really good sense of what the South Asian American experience is, all of the, vari the variety of the South Asian American experience, but also, like we were talking about the anthology's title, the chorus that speaks together. So the 49 voices are. Um, so, I mean, they capture, I don't know, do you want to take <laughs> Sure, I mean, one of the, so as Sumi was saying, that one of, the, um, one of the great luxuries we had as editors of poetry was to bring together such disparate voices, literally from many different styles, um, as you'll hear this evening, um, different aesthetics, but also um, people who are dealing with very different um, experiences within, um, within the continent of America, those who were first-generation uh, first immigrants to those who were, who'd been here and whose families had been here for um, a few hundred years, um, as well as those who kind of claimed the space of South Asian America in a way that perhaps might be surprising to those on the outside. So we have um, a poet such as um, Sasha Parmasad, who is from the Caribbean, whose family emigrated there um, five generations ago, um, worked on the sugar plantations, and then came to America. And she, so she identifies very strongly with the Caribbean community in this country, but has a bloodline that traces back to India. And so she's included in this, uh, in, in this book, and a, lot, and a lot of her work is actually about the experience uh, of uh, indentured servants on the sugar plantations. And, um, so she's just one example of, of the many varied voices. And one of the things that we did um, choose to do in editing the book was to, um, rather than to do what had been done uh, in other mixed genre anthologies, which was basically to compartmentalize the anthology in terms of themes, uh, we decided that as this was the first and representative, quite a representative text, um, that we had the responsibility of um, really representing our poets first and foremost, rather than themes that we thought were, might or might not be existent in their work. And so the sections in the book um, are representative of the poets. There are 49 sections for the 49 poets, and in each section you have a biography and a range of some of the different poems um, that at least give you a sense of what the, the, the poet uh, works on. And we also decided to try and uh, 
uh, capture the, wait, the naughty pro pro problem of identity. Yeah, and I was just going to say one of the reasons why we decided to organize the book by poet was that we were in the process of putting together this anthology and trying to look for a publisher. We were pushed by many um, different academic presses um, to organize it by theme or you know the, the the sort of stereotypical themes of ethnic identity, immigration story, um, gender, um, a couple you know um, mythology things like that and. We found ourselves removing poems when we were trying to organize it in these themes because the, they were poems that didn't fit these themes very clearly. And there was something wrong with the themes, not with the poems. The poems were interesting. The poems were complicated. They transcended those themes. And so it was really important for us to go back to the writers and to contextualize this from the writers. But maybe we should introduce the next person. And yes, keep yes. <laughs> and uh, one of the examples of how we tried to keep true and honest to um, the sense of each poet's identity was that we asked each poet um, to come up with a statement, a one to two sentence statement concerning their, their own sense of self-identity. Um, and so we have a range of answers um, going from Amitava Kumar, for example, who says, I am a resident father, a non-resident Indian, and a global citizen of the world created by Bollywood. Um, to <laughs> Ralph Nazareth, for example. And again, this is touching on what Sumi said earlier. There's a sense of the chorus. By listening to all the different voices, the variegation in the voices, you get a sense of um, you know, the, the, the multiplicities that are, that are present uh, in whatever is South Asia America. And so another poet, Ralph Nazareth, in his statement says, a Mangalorean Catholic, I pray in Konkani, count in Canada, swear in Tulu, sing in Hindi, write in English, and dream in American. And um, the last statement I'll read is by our next poet, Swati Rana, um, who, and this, is, this was actually a very hard exercise that we presented everyone with, of course, asking them to um, define themselves in two sentences. Um, but uh, Swati, when, when, she, when she had a gun put to her head by the three editors, said, I am part Hyderabadi Punjabi and Har Haryanvi and take to the forests of Vermont and the Northern Californian coast. So I'll introduce Swati, uh, who's our next poet. Born in India, uh, Swati Rana immigrated to Canada at the age of 10 before moving to the United States and attending Dartmouth College. Rana's poems have appeared in the Berkeley Poetry Review, Salt, Main Street, Word, and Uncommon Threads. And she is a recipient of the Academy of American Poets Prize as well as the Sydney Cox Memorial Prize. Um, she's currently, I think, finished her first collection of poems, um, or nearly finished her first collection <laughs> of poems, um, but as, uh, which cover a sense of workaday life and subsistence, um, as well as a series of short stories. And, uh, and of course, there is a small matter of a doctoral dissertation, which I believe she's finishing as well. Um, and so here she is, Swati Rana. Thank you. Um, I'll begin by reading a poem from the anthology that's called To Reveal. To Reveal. I lay where the sun wasn't in the mouth of your deep room as you examined with inconstant hands your first patient. I wore white bloomers then, my hair always in pigtails, curled tightly, dissonant with this moment of undoing. My breath evolved to the drone of the ceiling fan, to the slap of lizards dropping, scurrying to dark spaces, while you listened with my Fisher-Price stethoscope, bold and yellow like a steady finger of light that moved across the floor, reaching and uncovering. Show me yours and I'll show you mine, but I, too nervous even to look, saw only where my mother had sewn my name to my white bloomers, blooming in red, saying all the guilt she gave me. Um, so that poem is the reason why I haven't to give the anthology to my mom. <laughs> um, I'm not worried that she'll be upset about the guilt part, but I think that she'll read it as a tragedy of my life, that I never became a doctor, because I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's what the Fisher-Price stethoscope was intended to achieve when I was, like, <laughs> eight years old. Um, so now I'm going to read a couple of uh, recent poems. They're from uh, the collection of poetry that I'm working on. And I've adopted a persona in the collection. Um, after I read Fernando Pessoa, I just found the idea of a persona very freeing. Um, and it, it traces the, a day in the life of Madame Curry, 
Um, and I'm thinking of curry powder and you know, the stereotypes that surround Indian f femininity. Um, and she's kind of not, she doesn't quite live up to that. She doesn't like cooking. She, she's curmudgeonly in many ways and middle class and reluctant. And I kind of see her as an heir to Eliot and Naipaul and everything that's wrong with both of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so this section is called, is, the, the sections aren't titled, but this section is set in the morning, and just before getting out of bed. Morning discovers itself without my doing or having done. I say sheep. If I keep my eyes shut, I can stay here. The morning feels dead these days as reasons are dwindling. Morning, little brown box with a heavy lid, which I cannot lift with any ease. Is it time to be rushed? OK, maybe I can. Do I still have to wake up for boring reasons in the opal morning? Do I still have to wake up if it rains madly in the trees? Do I still have to wake up to this very world, too much with itself? Morning is a big blue question in the sky which looks like an excuse to sleep. I can't see the morning crow outside my window. A small bird pecking at my window scares me this morning, when green on leaves wetted and re-wetted by several days' rain, sloughs in the sun. We get so little of encouragement from life as it is these days. The bird is an accident, omen, or hello, here I am, newly peopling the leaves. The breathing body beside me is only human. Hands are only thus, and yet great things have been done without hesitation. The morning reminds me to forget that I matter in myself for no one else. Morn sounds like morn, which makes me feel better. I might well go to where the sky begins and the sky shows the pink of flesh. I hold it to me like a warm blanket. Look into your closed eyes. Life means in the order of lifelessness until taken over blue mountains like a river finding among cypress its own blue means. Lilies smell nice and the sky is a pallor of happiness. Morning is an elegy for lost lines the line of your furrowed brow, smooth in sleep. The line of dewy youth winding around the block. The line of our sinewed love, of your mad self dashing out the front door. Frank clothes line extending our undergarments. That last issue of my throat tangled in its own need. I'm scared in the morning to wake up into the likeness of a life I try and lead daily. Life's like a book whose pages are stuck at a dull part, whereas others I see are leading more exciting lives on account of money or gla glamour or love. I want, I want, I want another life than the one ahead like a road, tired of itself, ready to go home, to where roads go, to the house in the midmost of the wood, which frees you knowing you'll return, cannot escape by paths taken and won't leave them. What makes us happy is the long life well lived, what makes us happy is the slow expiration, the chance to give over in our only way the last page of the last book. What makes us happy waking up in the morning, though sad, though lonely? Petals of the flower break and take their downward spiral. We sweep them each morning until the vase too, rotund, red, is broken, though perfect seeming. So that's Morn. And I, I think in many ways it's about not wanting to wake up and work on my dissertation. <laughs> but <clears throat> hopefully it's about a bit more than that. But <clears throat> um, The next section of, of this long poem is sort of my, it's very recent, and it's my attempt to think through the character of Madame Curry and to some of the consistencies and contradictions that she represents. Day grubber, semaphore. Myopia. Hewn for the task at hand, she will file any paperwork with alacrity, join the line with the temerity of a minor god. Leonine to the very fear of mouse, spice that hates to be cooking. Tall as an achievement and just as small, her trenches dig deep yet broachable. Bred of large brood of many mother, she was left out as to weather on an endless isle, arctic tether, she winters like spent cabbages, turns old though young, gray though brown, white though blackest of hair and eye, salt wind seasoned color of white. 
Going forth, forth unrecognized, she like a strange subspecies of apple given to chance. In another life, she played in petticoats in the rain. In another life, she queen of divan and harmonium, now serves customers without complaint, smelly ones with food for excuses. Welcome to her refrain, blight of daily politeness, died down to the roots. She once bearer of puddles and paper boats, storm weather vane, balconies, her secret places all open all around comes to wear a slant roof on her head and give each morning the Lord's prayer on demand. She coax flower petals, eat banana varietals, run super secret societies without being called to account, say what will, run wherever with all allowances. Small wonder she sees no further than her nose in this too new with itself. Hollow drum, big sound and no fire, spent hearth, she of many friend, now alone with brassy lockers and clean corridors in recesses where visibly she lacks company. Fresh humiliation, chilled to bone, briny wintered, all alone with each new cruelty. Lesson one, go strong and unapproachable in ill-fitting clothes, down two clean roads and over polite fences, always the personal affront of weather. Go by without drawing the least attention, her ninth ambition, never suffer to be seen. Seventeenth lesson of bland lunches, disengaged from smell, have none, seek none, none exude. Smell no more than cafeteria smell, else shame, color more red than skin. Lesson of never liking anyone openly, look better, be quicker, never caught out in cold without gloves or the occasional patter and phrasing. Lesson 26, hold joy inward, smartness even never outspoken with the right answer. 43rd lesson of never taking up an invitation unless possessed of the right yeses and evening dresses, best loved by teachers and hated by friends, of what white people like in tutelage till it comes to wearing fleece in staring colors. Her lionizing part dreams of Hercules, bearing teeth and flesh, audiences enraptured. Inward functions are the only ones she dare attend. Loud inclinations stuffed in a suitcase closed through years of arrival under far-flung reaches of the bed. She outside brown, white for filling. Learned learner of parlor games, soothing accents. Just the right time and it's ticking. Consistency, her spice of life. The color of everyone else. It will be years before self turns to selves. Then too reluctantly. She forged in her own private struggle, tallies her gains and losses, illusions of a singular person brought to ocean crossing. To grow out of this phase is to grow into someone else. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> So Swathi already read Perini's bio, so I'm here to just introduce Perini Sundarilinga. <laughs> <She's gonna read. laughs> Hi. Did you mention that I edited a book recently? Co-edited uh -huh. a book. <laughs> that's pretty much what. Um, that's kind of the main thing I've been thinking about. Um, but um, I'm also a scientist, so um, I juggle and procrastinate in many different domains, <laughs> uh, not just one. I think my father, uh, my father said once to me, you know, not only have you failed to win the Nobel Prize in literature, you've actually managed to fail to win the Nobel Prize in two different disciplines, so. <laughs> which, which is actually a South Asian father's way of saying I love you. So, um, <laughs> um, so this is for my dad, I guess. Um, this is a, a, a poem about, um, you know, I've started, I, for, for a long time, people asked me why I didn't combine the two disciplines, and now I guess I'm finally doing that. Um, I just today uh, put to bear the final issue, uh, an issue on uh, for World Literature Today, which is a special issue on science and literature, and I had to kind of grapple with uh, the thorny question of whether, uh, whether how one can write about science uh, within uh, literature. Um, having said that, here's <laughs> my attempt, I guess. Um, so um, I was really interested um, in the story of W.A. Bentley, who's an American um, 
young American farmhand who was, um, for religious reasons, by his parents kept away from kind of any kind of scientific education, so grew up on a farm, um, but and yet was very hungry to find out about the world around him. This is in the 1880s in Vermont, and uh, managed to somehow uh, read newspapers and get hold of information somehow before Google uh, about the exciting world of optics and photography that was um, beginning to um, be born in this country. And he managed to, um, despite being on this little farm in Vermont, find enough equipment uh, to build his own camera and be the first person to photograph a snowflake. And, um, and his theories about snowflakes still hold true. No one has disproved them. And I thought there was this interesting um, you know, tension between religion uh, and those who think that science is actually antagonistic towards religion versus those who think that perhaps science might reveal something of the wonder of the world. So this is a story. So it's a poem about W.A. Bentley. It's called Vermont 1885. Each year we disappear into the formless white, the snow erasing mile upon mile of our neighbor's farms. Preacher says, so shall we all come unto judgment day, diminished by the level gaze of God. I go home to my attic silence, adjust focal length and lenses, grind out the sea green glass. Microscope and camera, beneath their quiet stare, the snow disappears, is replaced by a single unique six-pointed star. Um, I'll read a, a couple of other um, poems which are on a different theme. Um, I think Swati probably mentioned that I was born in Sri Lanka. I don't know. <laughs> this is so exciting, coming into the middle of a reading, having no idea what was said about me. Um, I was born in Sri Lanka um, and raised both there and then subsequently in Great Britain. Um, I'm, I come from a family who um, were Tamil in heritage, and the civil war in Sri Lanka went on for 30 years, decimating most of my generation. Um, and so I felt that it's incumbent upon me, um, as one of the survivors of the ethnic cleansing, to kind of speak out about that, not just the experience of the war in Sri Lanka, but also the sense of what it's like to be in the diaspora, as, um, as this is a real problem for those of us who... Um, survived um, in terms of getting any kind of understanding from the outside world in terms of political asylum or even basic social services. Um, so anyway, uh, one of the things that, um, so I guess um, this piece is about the breakdown of language that happens um, when one is in exile and when you've come through a civil war, so much of what you talk about is becomes very problematic. You can't speak freely, even in a country where you have your freedom. It becomes very difficult when you talk to another person from your homeland because of the memories, the unfortunate traumas that are revealed. And so I wanted to write about that experience of how language gets fragmented, uh, even in freedom. Um, and an example of that, I guess, to try and explain what's going on is that um, when you see another person from your homeland and you see the stranger in a street, you have this great desire to talk to them. Um, but as you cross the street and try to form the first words of small talk, um, you find that even those words become politically fraught. So asking someone what their name is, if you're a Sri Lankan and they recognize you as a Sri Lankan, to, to say your name is to reveal your ethnic identity, to say something about which side of the war you are on, um, whether you are persecutor or persecuted. Um, even to say which village or which city did you come from reveals which region you are in, and again, whether you were the oppressed or the oppressor. Um, so all of those simple questions like your name, what is your name, when did you leave, <laughs> when, where did you, which city did you live in, uh, become frozen in your, mind, in, your, in your mouth and you find that you can't actually speak to that stranger and you have no words that you can share anymore. So this piece is called Language Like Birds. It is Paris, Berlin, New York. It is any one of countless cities, any one of endless lands in which we find ourselves, 
our careless hurrying through crowds cut short, silenced in one moment by the sight of teeth and hands and jaw, by the familiarity of bone. These are the faces that reflect our own, the eyes of exiles that will search and search again for patterns in the skin, kinship in the bones, history in the handshape of strangers. But we have no words to express our loss, no tools to measure out the length of our leaving. Fleeing before the war's black howl, we left behind language, words too heavy a burden to carry. Destiny, family, fate. These are the words that remain when we find each other in foreign lands, when we break open each word of our language to share, to savor, to set free. We open our throats and language like birds bursts from our lips, words exploding across city streets, brief as the violence of gunfire. Um, <clears throat> I'm often asked to speak for various um, organizations such as Amnesty and Penn, uh, and I do a lot of work for Survivors International, who um, are ba actually based here in Berkeley, who help the victims of torture. Um, and one of the things that I'm at pains um, to stress is that the experience of those of us who survived the Sri Lankan genocide are sadly not unique to Sri Lanka. There's nothing particularly special about being Sri Lankan. Sadly, at this point, one in five people on this planet um, are displaced from their homelands. And there's a chilling um, sense in which these stories become recycled time and again across continents and countries. And so I hope that um, you know these words are not just about the kind of the tragedy of Sri Lanka, but about other things. And um, one of the things that concerns me is what happens to refugee women. And um, I was looking back through the Bible and turned to the Old Testament for stories, and it seems to me that the story of Lot's wife in there is a quintessential story of exile and um, the experience of being a refugee. And I, I know there are, you know, there are various interpretations of uh, that story of Lot's wife, and of course several poets have um, <clears throat> you know, created their own versions, such as Stanley Kunitz, um, Maria Tsatsayeva, um, many different people of this version of kind of Lot's wife and the story of Lot's wife. And, and, and I was really interested to see that kind of rabbinical texts kind of look at this um, story in the Old Testament and say, this story means, is a story telling us that um, basically women are disobedient, right? That the, the woman who was told you're allowed to flee your homeland and survive on the understanding that whatever you do, you cannot turn back and look at your um, burning city. And um, of course she does and becomes turned into a pill of salt. And so there are scholars who believe that this is evidence yet again of women's inherent disobedience. Um, and that even when the angel of the Lord is telling you what to do as a woman, you don't listen. Um, so I didn't think that, that was particularly satisfying as an interpretation. Um, there's actually another interpretation out there which says that, um, of course, that salt is the most valuable commodity uh, in the Middle East. And so uh, when your family is fleeing through the desert and they have no possessions, the best thing you can do as a woman is turn yourself into a condiment. Um, <laughs> so... You know, I thought about that lesson and tried to see if I could apply it to my own life and um, failed. So <laughs> um, I guess, you know, I thought a little bit more. And, and to me, the story, I guess, means that um, I think what they're saying is that maybe if we look at it as a metaphor, that she's not literally frozen, that any one of us who has seen a tragedy unfold in front of us that has seen the first time you witness um, the death of another human being in front of you, and that can be through war or through a you know, car accident on the 280, there's a part of you that remains forever frozen in time. Something very interesting happens in the space-time continuum. And while your identity and your physical body moves onward, I think that part of you remains in that scene. So I want, to me, I wonder if that's what that story in the Bible is really about. And the last thing I have to say is that nowhere in all of these interpretations did, does anyone name the wife of Lot. She remains nameless. And I think that's quintessentially what happens. It's very typical of what happens to the identity of refugee women.
who, when they leave their homeland, become numbers on pieces of paper and lose their names. So this piece is called Lot's Wives. The piece is called Lot's Wives. We stood as women before us have stood, looking back at our burning cities, watching the smoke rise from our empty homes. It was quiet then and cold. We heard their cries, the caged birds clawing at their perches, our daughters naked in the hungry mob. Such death, the smell of justice drifting on the burnt wind. And we saw it all, saw the fire fall like rain, saw our tears track stiff white veins down our bodies, saw the brine crawl through salt-cracked skin. Now, turning in the restless night, we dream we stand there still, Alone on the hill's black belly, we, the forgotten, whose names were swallowed by God. Okay, thank you. So I now have to switch hats and, and leave aside the poetic hat and become the editor again. Um, one of the exciting things about putting together this anthology was... Um, that, as Sumi said, we, we felt that we were really trying to explode some of the stereotypes that existed out there. Um, we were approached by various publishers who were very excited about the manuscript we had, and um, they offered us contracts, um, and there, but there were certain strings attached to these contracts. And so some of those strings, one string, for example, was the idea that we would organize the uh, anthology by themes, as we mentioned. Um, but there were all kinds of other very interesting ideas that started to come into play. And one was, for example, that we should have an index at the back in which we could, um, people could search uh, for, pay, you know, look up page numbers of various topics. So if you wanted to look up which poets had written about love, you could look at pages 6, 7, 300 to 400. I mean, basically that you could, basically, um, you know, the idea that there were keywords that were, existed within each poem and that as editors we could, you know, note that down and put that in an appendix at the end. Um, there, were, um, there were all kinds of suggestions that we should have a theme of food and maybe just look at food or we should just look at sex or we should just look at mythology. And the editors, the, the three of us started to talk about, joke about this, the idea of Kama Sutra and curry, that basically the uh -huh. assumption was that South Asian American poets wrote about Kama Sutra poems or curry poems. Um, so we therefore very much enjoyed the fact that there were poets who um, really bust open those stereotypes that when they did talk about food uh, or mangoes or you know rice, um, that they they were they felt at liberty to explode those stereotypes in in many different ways. Um, and and so a wonderful example of that is the work of Ravi Chandra, our next poet. Um, who in one of his poems, which I don't know if he's going to, he will be sharing with us today, um, looks at that idea of the, the racial epithet, and I hope he'll tell us more about that later, but he, he, he looks at food imagery, but he stands it on its head rather than write, you know, writing a nice lyrical poem about the beauty of the mango, which I'm sure he's quite capable of doing. He actually stands that imagery on its head, which is very exciting. Um, and Ravi is also, um, you know, an interesting poet for, for another reason, which is that he is um, a wonderful exemplar of uh, another uh, style, um, which is, you know, as um, his, his bio uh, explains, he was actually part of the San Francisco Slam team a couple of years ago. Um, and has, you know, I think his first kind of emerging as a poet was within the slam scene, the spoken word scene. And so you can hear the kind of wonderful rhythms that he encapsulates in his work. And of course, now he's writing a whole variety of different styles. But um, that's certainly one of the things that first drew us to his work. So to tell you a little bit about Ravi, um, 
He um, graduated from Brown University with a degree in biology uh, before going on to Stanford Medical School. He now practices psychiatry at a community mental health uh, clinic where he serves predominantly Asian and Russian uh, immigrant populations, and he's also in private practice. In terms of his poetic work, um, he was awarded first prize in um, one, of the Stanford, one of Stanford's poetry contests. Um, the, uh, he's also published uh, his poetry uh, and, and also had his work published in the chapbook produced by Stanford Medical Center. Um, he was an alternate on the 2002 San Francisco SLAM team, and um, he also um, is very involved with the film world here in San, Fran uh, in San Francisco. Where, uh, for example, he writes the blog Memoirs of a Superfan for the International Asian American Film Festival. So here he is, Ravi Chandra. Thanks, Pyrene, and thank you all for, for being here. It's so good to see you. And how's Berkeley doing tonight? Woo! All right, doing good. All right. <laughs> OK, so this was written back in my slam days. And I changed the order of my poems uh, to honor Pyrene's uh, introduction. Um, uh, this is uh, an identity poem and a food poem. Uh, so uh, uh, I'll, I'll just go ahead and read it. It's called Clean Up on Aisle 3. Why is it that every kind of person out there has their counterpart in food? No matter if the skin's bleached or baked, epicanthus blepharoplastid turning almond eyes to permanently shocked lychee size, let's face it, when your exterior complexion doesn't match your interior direction, you're on the menu for racial epicurification. The Oreo was the original food slur, a nicer way to symbolize the person whose insides and insights didn't match their standout outsides. Banana wasn't far behind for those who weren't bananas about their yellow hue. And coconuts, I'm, I hate to say, might look like me, but their brains are pure white matter. But before I got too down on the whiter persuasion, I met one, first one hard-boiled egg, then a dozen, and wondered a time or two if I wasn't a tea egg, brown on the outside, golden on the inside after all, or a sweet potato, brown on the outside, Buddhist on the inside, or just a plain Reese's peanut butter cup, always in search of a Hershey's hug, I'll settle for a kiss. A mint chocolate drop, a sweet brown girl who joined the greens, a juicy peach, a soft and fuzzy Buddhist with a hard center that could break your teeth. I would say a mango, but that mango seed kind of scares me. Or even an avocado, an ecologist that could break your teeth. Vegetarian hot pocket or three cheese bagel bite? Don't even ask. Yes, I'll admit it, I've spent hours in Safeway aisles just trying to figure out what or who I am. Call it existential hunger only to realize that no matter what you look like, it's what's inside that counts. Which is why I'm a scrambled egg burrito in a tomato tortilla with black beans, basmati rice, guacamole, and sriracha, garnished with a sweet papaya chutney and with a side of bitter melon. I'm good with tongues, I don't break teeth. Your stomach might not agree with me and your nose won't know me, but I'm nutritious, guaranteed, and I'm on your plate. Your eyes have never seen a dish like me before, and I'm not just for breakfast anymore. <laughs> All right. Our, our book was launched on the same day that the iPad launched, uh, actually April 3rd of this, uh, the, this year. So I wrote this poem uh, on that occasion. It's also what I'd call a mirthful editorial. iPad, oh God. I craved, I pad, I broke, I don't even know what I have. A shimmering book or the end of books, Endless consumption or the end? Someone once told me that the papers tell us whom to hate, and then we go to war. What we need, and then we need it. We've gone from washboards to washing machines, from movie screens to holding screens that fold the world into the palm of your hand, fitting a space we didn't even know exists. Our palms are always open, and even a palm isn't enough. Grasping what delights, we smooth away friction between needing a thing and having it. Nirvana is digital completion, a download away, while samsara is an iPhone's drop connection. We measure our lives in bit rates and whore our towns for Google speed. Thus spake the server farm, thus spake Steve Jobs. Eliot wrote, desire itself is movement, not in itself desirable. But, is this, mo but this movement drives the whole world round, or does it? Love itself is unmoving, only the cause and end of movement. We buy things we think we love, 
but it's only desire, a screen between me and you. Maybe that screen is liminal and not limiting, a way to love you and not just myself even more. Only time will tell, only a poet will sing this song. Eve said it best, whatever it costs, the apple must be eaten. Thanks. <laughs> So um, it's such an honor to be to read with uh, such beautiful, deep, thoughtful poets, and I feel like I go in a really different direction <laughs> with my poems. So thank you. Um, uh, the next poem is also about technology, and that's a real South Asian theme. Maybe we can put that in the next version of the book. Um, uh, so uh, this is this is about Facebook. Uh, what is up with a new trend of reporting on changes in Facebook on the network nightly news? It, it's kind of weird to see uh, an anchor talking about face smash or that email thingy. I mean, is this really of national security importance? I mean, it's it's there. Um, I, I, Facebook is taking over, but I, I don't think we should go down without a fight. Um, I mean, I wrote this, and then then I you know started getting emails about you know hunger and cholera and Haiti and tragedies in Vietnam and so forth, and, and still we're, we're, you know, Facebook is, is on the network news. So this is called Something Borrowed, Something Blue, because we're kind of wedded to Facebook. Katie Couric reports on the evening news, a new app has been released today. Facebook and the universe have been merged, forming the F-universe, the F-U-niverse. In the F-U-niverse, life is not lived but updated, we don't measure our lives in coffee spoons, but in comments liked, in e-repartee, emoticons, and awkward postings that you wish you could forget. Oh yeah, you know what I'm talking about. 80% <laughs> of what we do is totally pointless, says the Dalai Lama. In FU, we can get close to 100 <laughs> and make it all permanently accessible, like, we can express something, and that's gotta be good, right? Right? Maybe it's Facebook art, or F art, like, we keep a thin screen distance and defriend to keep us safe in here. It's, it is safer in here, so fortunately, we can keep the, making the world scarier. Fact, smiley face. I love FU, or at least like it. I hate FU for what it's doing to us, extending a glimmer of socializing with barely a shred of sustenance and occasionally shredded minds constantly sli flipping through notifications on smartphones that make us dumb, but fancy. We don't, we don't feel the need to meet because we already know too, too much, or think we do. Blue walls surround us, tiny blue boxes squeezing big mind into narrow confines. I want someone with humor and a heart to come find me and upload me to someplace freer. Thanks. The last poem is also a food poem. Um, and I have to read it tonight because my mom is here in the audience and it's kind of about my mom too. Rice. My mom swears on rice. If she were a witness in court, her right hand would go down on biryani fresh from the pot. If she were president, she'd take the oath of office on steaming basmati on the Capitol steps. So help me sag paneer. <laughs> to her, rice is holier than the, Bible, than the Bible or Bhagavad Gita's. The song of God vies with the sound of the rice cooker cover clattering at dinner time. The most serious moments I've had in life were at the table when she declared, I tell it in front of rice as if lying and long grain don't mix, as if jasmine dispelled jive, as if God made us in his image, but especially the stomach, thus making meals a shared offering with heaven. From my mouth to God's ears, and from my rice pot to Buddha's belly. Minnesotans don't swear on spam, but maybe Hawaiians do, when it's on rice. And I can't see Tejanas intoning solemnly over tortillas, and to be honest, I've never heard another Indian do it, so maybe it's just her. More weirdness peculiar to my family, go figure. My mom didn't raise me, she riced me. <laughs> Maybe it's vestigial, a throwback to hard days when rice was rare and people remembered when they ate, what they ate, and what you said when they ate. Or maybe she knows that that's when she's really got my attention, when I'm waiting for food. Or maybe mealtimes make her philosophical, Pulau predisposing to profound pronouncements. Or maybe rice is just more available than the Vedas. Then again, we throw rice at weddings, and rice is on every Buddhist and Hindu altar, and the best rice is grown on holy Himalayan waters, and rice is responsible for many natural phenomena, like the dinnertime fog in San Francisco. <laughs> I imagine aroma-laden steam gently stirring prayer flags in Nepal, and Krishna granting palaces to his boyhood pal for a pocket full of pua and a smile. 
But even more divine than rice or oath is mother herself. One night, I dreamed her picking grains in a patty, meticulously carving them with one word, love, thousands of times, just to make one meal. Thank you. Simi's nervous in case I say, as to what I would say about her after <laughs> seven years of working together. <laughs> um, but I actually want to do kind of close by talking about why I think um, Simi's work is so, so um, such a wonderful example that um, it's such a quintessential part of the anthology. Um, we were very excited in putting together the anthology to look at... Um, the idea, um, as the book is called Indivisible, the idea that we were not, as South Asian American poets, something unusual or strange or um, to be ghettoized within the literary community, but very much to lay claim to the fact that we were quintessentially part of the American landscape, um, albeit part of a landscape that perhaps may not have, may have been neglected somewhat. And so um, we, we found it um, very exciting as we did research for the book to find there were so many ways in which the culture of South Asia and the culture of America had come together within literature. So for those of you um, who know of the great um, Bengali poet Rabindranath Tagore, uh, I, I, see most, I think most people here would have heard of him, but how many would have known that he, uh, there was an assassination attempt against his life and that that happened in North Beach, San Francisco. So um, here, you know, he lived for several years in San Francisco and uh, formulating, doing part of his political work there and writing some of his uh, poetry. Uh, and he came here partly because he was influenced by um, the founding fathers of this country and wanted to be part of um, the philosophizing going on at the time at the turn of the century. Um, and there have been all kinds of exciting connections between the literatures of the two continents, uh, sidestepping Europe. Who needs Europe? We'll just kind of go and find these connections between South Asia and America. Um, so we, and, and I'm, I'm sure many of you here would be familiar with the way in which T.S. Eliot turned to Indian mythology to look at some of those symbols um, and poets from many of the American schools of poetry, from the Black Mountain School, the New York School, have looked at um, great South Asian epic poems. Um, so we felt that it was kind of coming full circle to hopefully include a poet uh, out there who was a current contemporary poet um, who was actually from a South Asian bloodline looking at um, the images and icons of America as well as the images and icons of South Asia. And so um, Sumi's work in her, her Bollywood, Hollywood hybridities uh, are very exciting, and I hope she'll be sharing some of those today. Thank you, Parini. Um, <laughs> thanks. So I have a three-and-a-half-week-old baby at home, so I have not been writing very actively. So when I say I'm writing a series called A Personal Cinema, I say it very loosely. I'm writing. <laughs> um, but hopefully I will be able to get back to it. But as Parini said, um, I started this series. I'm very interested in pop, pop culture and memoir and how, um, how we might see ourselves and our experiences through pop culture. And in my particular case, I was interested. I started with um, a lot of bad Bollywood movies from the 1970s, which were very much kind of like the soundtrack of my youth, and started to think about like how, how those things actually were the soundtrack of my youth and how I could capture that. And so um, I wrote a couple of poems about that, and then I realized there were a lot of like bad Hollywood movies from my childhood also that were kind of the soundtrack of my youth. So I'm gonna share a couple of these. This one's called Hare Rama, Hare Krishna, and they're actually titled after the movie. So if, if any of you have seen this movie, um, it's, it's loosely, um, the plot is about um, a very, very famous movie actor, actress named Zena Thaman plays um, this woman who is from a family that um, experiences divorce and has come abroad, and this is why divorce happens, of course, because divorce would never happen in South Asia. Um, that that's a joke, and <laughs> you can laugh there. And um, and how uh, this leads her to become a hippie and go off to Kathmandu and do lots of drugs and then want to commit suicide. 
So you, you can see how, how this might all happen from divorce and from coming to the West. So Hare Rama, Hare Krishna. After Jess Beer, almost blind, loses her glasses, it's all downhill. Daddy's flirtations unzip the family unit. In a swift and untenable fork in the story, mom and Prashant are gone. Dead? Something like that. Back then, the distance between continents, like the suspension of disbelief in this story, was insurmountable. The bold girl flips her hurt into a Kerouac karmic love and trades co Coke bottle glasses for glamorously large pink frames. I ditched mine too and got hip after slipping on the word rhetoric and losing the eighth grade spelling bee. A beaten up copy of the Dharma Bums, the one she borrowed from me, on her bedside table next to the painkillers and poppers. What does the world care about us, she sings, as she puffs at a pipe and raises her arms to the sky. When I first lost my religion, I sullenly dreamt of the rooftop parties on Rose Street and wondered, punch drunk, if the beats might help me find it. Flubbing chemistry and fingering poetry like a new charm, I hummed, the mudder them, with the image of Zenith's backside like an hourglass ticking at the hip. Descent into hell, we're supposed to believe, is made easier by a corrupted Canadian background. Only the West can beget such exquisite womanly decadence, and I am filled with admiration and autobiography. And so now, um, I haven't read this poem very much, and it's still kind of in its nascency, but I thought it might be fun to read regardless. Um, so one of, one of the films that I probably watched over 200 times in my youth, and which was remade recently, but um, is maybe not the exact same story, is The Karate Kid. Um, so, but uh, but I, I can't imagine that it, the Karate Kid, the original Karate Kid, could be surpassed by the more recent one with Jaden Smith. It wasn't. Okay, good. I'm, I'm glad. Thank you for that confirmation. So, The Karate Kid. And I think, you know, I've chosen these movies in part because I really saw myself in these various, you know, in, I identified very strongly with, with the characters, and so you can see in this poem, I identify very strongly with Daniel, Daniel son. So, The Karate Kid. The first thing Daniel's mother notices when she gets out of the car in California is palm trees. Daniel's not amused. He misses the Jersey snow and the kids from his hood. The stereotype of California, blonde girls with karate black belt boyfriends is a tough place for a skinny Italian teenager, a tough place for an Indi Indian kid with a slow southern drawl. I follow Daniel in altered footsteps, tracing Steinbeck's trek like an old archy. After setting foot in the San Joaquin Valley, we discovered that our safe arrival, not a drop of oil left in the engine, was a minor miracle. I left behind an unrequited crush on a dark-haired boy with an uncomfortably Germanic name. I soothed myself with the thought of shopping malls stretching across whole city blocks. Junipers rose to the sky. I was not impressed. Methane and manure, my dreams of a glamorous California, weren't about to suddenly come true. My only friend's house smelled of sloppy joes and cat pee. We listened to Madonna and Cinderella embracing the Holy Mother with fairy tales and marveled at her mother's voluminous collection of eight tracks stacked in shoeboxes. Meanwhile, Daniel's wandering eye lands in a landmine. A cheerleader named Allie with an eye from Encino. Losing my girlfriend to this freak? Johnny's pissed. Daniel getting pushed around at a beach party. All the socialites laughing as Daniel swims in a pool of spaghetti. Daniel being kicked repeatedly in the gut. Johnny, the slender handsomeness of William Zabka as the ultimate villain, guzzles his ex-vet turned karate sensei's motto, motto like gas, finish him. Time will rescue Daniel from the antisocial qualities of teenage boys, but he'll be a dead man before it happens. 
I struggled to climb the social ladder, or at the very least, to not hang from the bottom rung, too. The cool kids listened to Depeche Mode and psychedelic furs, special ordered t-shirts and posters from Xerox zines, and did the best new wave dances. Everything converged in the eighth grade honors English class, where we, throwing our forearms in circles, kicking our feet and jumping quarter turns, bellowed the words to REM's stand. Weekends were a painful reminder that as a newcomer, I was building myself from scratch. I played Super Mario Brothers with my brother and made friends with Punjabi girls who developed crushes on boys in their classes, not knowing whether they were in line for arranged marriages. Daydreaming was like an addiction, at once numbing and heightening the pain of living vicariously. Daniel's not immune. He needs rescuing, too. Mr. Miyagi, the Japanese man who tends bonsais and catches flies with chopsticks, drops like divine intervention from the top of the fence. Practically forgetting his recent brush with death, Daniel is pleased to discover that his building super is a karate master. Everything learned is again forgotten. Daniel is a Bichon Fries barking madly at a bulldog. Miyagi knows that what Daniel really needs is to get the hell out, but he further embroils him in fighting the regional championships. The faux Asian music, the elegant, sobering sound of the flute, signals the end of comedy. Nevertheless, the movie temporarily descends into the absurd. Miyagi hands Daniel a bucket of suds and tells him to wash a lot full of jalopies. What the hell does waxing, sanding, and painting have to do with karate? But they do. The screenwriter's creativity is commendable. I built the muscle of my nerdiness with weekend math competitions, knowing that college, a dream of underwear made of something other than cotton, was my way out. Daniel's anger passes with the epiphany that he can fight. On his 16th birthday, his mother drives him in their clunker to alley with an eye's home. The front door, flanked by columns, is at the top of two dozen steps. The blonde descending the staircase to the swarthy mother in the car is a blunt object metaphor for race and class. Things hadn't worked out so well for me. Before the pendulum swung to the exotic, yoga, luxurious silk bedding, and the supremacy of the green-eyed goddesses of Bollywood, I existed in a swamp of invisibility and personal delusion. An insignificant detail from Teen Beat magazine magnified the possibility that Kirk Cameron could be my boyfriend. Driving an unpretentious car meant he wasn't looking for a shallow starlet. How this point generalized to me, I was a pudgy 13-year-old brown girl and he was a communal heartthrob, was evidence of the combined magic of teen thinking and of successful marketing. To conjure past feelings of lust is to remember what your neighbor's garden looked like before everything was erased with concrete. When Daniel returns from his date, Miyagi is drunk. He has waited with a cake and a set of car keys for Daniel's son. But Miyagi's vulnerability, it is the death anniversary of his wife and child who died in an internment camp, is the movie's most generous gift. Miyagi blooms under real history, just after Noriyuki Morita, baptized Pat by a Catholic priest, healed from a spinal problem and learned to walk, he was shift, shipped off to a camp. His own Japanese identity, minus the heavy husky accent and the body posturing of an immigrant, incriminated him. Morita eventually orchestrated his escape to Hollywood, later to be Oscar nominated for this role. Everyone's peeling back their layers. Everyone's getting all meta-meta. Sammy and I have our eyes glued to the screen. We've seen the movie so many times that we can anticipate every line. The song of adrenaline, you're the best around, nothing's gonna ever keep you down, pipes into the final scene. We obviously know the ending, but we're still rooting madly for the underdog. Our exodus from Arkansas, at first opaque, came sharply into focus, truth like the uncomfortably sticky sweat between my mosquito-bitten thighs. My father was dealt a losing hand at the start of the game. The dirt kicked into his face by the southern white upper class, but he couldn't quite believe it. All animals are created equal, but some are more equal than others. 
The brutality of those adolescent years stings, and I still hope the jocks would get their just desserts. Like a sapling in a maelstrom, Daniel's ready to be snapped. But do trees give up, allowing themselves passively to be broken? Daniel LaRusso's going to fight? Daniel LaRusso is going to fight. Miyagi clasps his hands. The wisdom of the mythical East gives him strength and tapes Daniel back together like a pathetically bandaged Humpty Dumpty. By now, Johnny's ready to give up his fisticuffs and let Allie with an eye find comfort in Daniel's arms. Against the backdrop of his sensei, brimming with flashbacks of killing Kong and craving bloodletting, Johnny is a near Buddha. This twig of a kid will win, and Daniel's victory will momentarily right every wrong. I watch the pride on Miyagi's face fade into darkness and know there will be a sequel. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Before we uh, go on to questions, um, we wanted to um, thank um, the many people who helped to organize um, the event today. Um, Lynn Herginian for welcoming us to um, the Berkeley campus. Um, Swati, of course, for um, instigating the process. And, and Rosa. Uh, Rosa Martinez, who did so much to organize the posters and the administration and create such a beautiful poster. Um, and, and thank you all for coming. And we, ha we have a really short period of time for Q&A. So any questions? Or you can come talk to us informally afterwards, too. So don't feel nervous or obligated. In fact, I'd ask for the poets to come up, because there yeah. might be questions addressed um, that you might want to answer. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> any daring soul? Great. Go ahead. At the very beginning of organizing the whole project, what was it like talking each other into it? <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, a good, that's, a, that's a great question. We haven't had that question <laughs> so far. Um, I think one of the ex uh, it, it, certainly challenging, but also in the end very exciting um, dynamics was created by the fact that the three editors came from very different um, poetic backgrounds. And so um, we, just as a matter of principle, felt that it was important that if we selected a poem for the book, it was something that we could justify to the other two poets and convince them um, that this was you know, a poem and a poet that was um, that we felt should should be endorsed, as it were. So we, in the end, we, we, we learned a lot about becoming advocates to not just say, well, this is our intuition and a hunch that this is a good poem. We had to be very, you know, learn how to be very clear um, in, in explaining why we thought these were good poems. And, and I think it was kind of a way that I think in martial arts you talk about, you know, having a partner. It's like a stone and a knife that you learn to kind of, um, you work with your partner that, the stone helps the, sh the knife get sharper, or some such karate kid <laughs> metaphor. <laughs> See how inspired I am? So I think it was like that. That pro For me, it was like that. I mean, I'm not saying who's the stone and who was the knife. But, <laughs> but you know, the working, and three of us, I think, was also a great dynamic to, to have. So it wasn't antagonistic. It was more something that we were trying to work out. Yeah, and I don't know if this, this is part of your question, but we came from very different aesthetic kind of uh, communities or vantage points and so it was kind of interesting and we we met um, I think you knew Neela before but we basically all met in the Bay Area just as writers and writers who kind of identified as South Asian writers as well as just poets you know and so um, it was it was a very organic process of having met and kind of getting together and then really getting to know each other in the process of doing this work I mean like Preeni said I think it's been eight years now but um, <laughs> it was seven until we got until the book came out Long gestation. Yeah. And, and, and it was our original publisher who brought us together and told us to work on the book. It was not something that we got together. and you know, we, So I think that was kind of also interesting. It was, um, the, the, it was the publisher's vision of having three very different people do the editing. Yep. So I think there was a question yes, back there. Yeah. Several questions. How do you spell in English Gazal? Uh, oh, it's spelled G-H-A-Z-A-L. Yeah. And Aga Shahid Ali, he, he was a poet, who's, he's, he's actually in the anthology, he, he, he's passed away, but he wrote a lot of guzzles in English and has a whole um, anthology of guzzles written in English called Ravishing Disunities. That might be a book you could check out. 
And the guzzle is also really commonly, um, it's a common form to Urdu too, which is, you know, a, a language that is, you know, influenced by both Persian as well as Hindi. So, makes sense. I think there was another question yes. or hand over here. Yes. Yeah. Uh, actually, I, I have the Ravish and Vizimidi's book from the library. You can't, you can't find it there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I have it because I, I, I use it to teach. Uh, and I, I, find, I find the book rather interesting. Yeah. I'm wondering how you might talk about uh, breaded, breaded vessels. Um, well, I was trying to write them in English myself because I'd seen Ravishing Disunities and read a lot from that anthology, but I think I, I wanted to, I found the form in English. Something was missing when I would just write a, a, just a straight guzzle. And, um, and sort of in the process of, I was reading that, but then I was also reading John Ashbery, The Skaters, which is a poem that sort of moves all over the place mentally and physically. So I wanted to find um, some way of using form, but also moving and making leaps and jumps between different types of forms, whether it's song or quotation or autobiography. So I would take the guzzle, I always start with the guzzle, but then I sort of take the couplets of it and break it up through these other forms and other imagery that I find interesting, and that's how I create the landscape for it. It's not a very formalized form, it's just sort of my own. Guzzle Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Sure. Anybody else? What way were some of the other poets influenced by other South Indian forms of poetry, like some of the traditional religious forms, popular songs? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. I don't know if it was always that clear. I think the guzzle is a more um, clear example of, of a connection, um, but there's lots of I mean, for example, in um, the poems that I, a couple of the poems that are in the anthology that I've written, the epics, um, I was really playing with like the epic form and how to tell a story um, that's about like, you know, the inception of something. And, and so I was sort of like, you know, thinking about intergenre work and thinking about poetry and thinking about um, how the Mahabharata is an epic poem and how to sort of like break that up. So I think, you know, I mean, there's, I don't know, I'm sort of rambling here, but I think that there's many other ways in which there are people who are working with those forms, but maybe not as directly. Does that make sense? Can you think yeah, of another well, example? I was, um, I was going to say that, I mean, there, there are examples like um, Shrikant's Reddy, um, an American poet based in Chicago, for example, who uh, one of the poems that we feature in here is called, it's called Jungle Book, so he's riffing off Kipling's famous kind of mm -hmm. South Asian right. classic, um, but ta you know, taking it back as a South Asian. Um, and then he's got a, um, a poem um, which again centers around um, one of Krishna's speeches in the Bhagavad Gita, but he, again, he's found a kind of more um, modern, he's kind of brought it up to contemporary times. Um, um, in terms of formal, I mean, I think it's in, you, you asked about South Asian forms, traditional forms, um, and, and something that we, we are at pains to point out is that our poets don't purely draw on South Asian forms. So just as much mm -hmm. we have, That's you know, we, we, they draw on, um, you know, that other continent. Uh, the, the, the European uh, traditions of the Villanelle, the Sestina, sonnets, we, we have all kinds of different, you know, examples of um, other forms. Um, so um, within the book, as well as obviously free verse. That's a good question. Yeah. yeah. We should probably that that up Okay, last, last one. Sure. Okay. Um, it's, it's uh -huh. uh, Bombay cinema, Indian cinema, and that kind of stuff. I'm doing some research looking at social experiences that are articulated through cinema practice. So mm -hmm. it could be kind of space of gender relations, it could be a space of creativity. So in your case, you kind of use your childhood experiences and how you kind of want to think about femininity. So it's kind of exciting to me that you were using popular culture in that way. Yeah, oh, cool. Thank you. <laughs> and so if people have other questions, um, we, I think we're doing a little bit of a book, a book signing, I believe. And so if you want to kind of approach the front, you can always speak to the poets individually. So, um, and I hope you do. So yeah. thanks very much for coming out. Thank you. Thank you.